Well, greetings and welcome to another LGR thing with a side of echoes. Yeah, I got a bunch more stuff in here and it's still echoing. This is not gonna be my main filming location going forward. I just, this is where I have a clear spot at the moment. And I just dug this out of storage. So what we have in here are a couple of computers that I believe I bought from Canada uh, some time ago. It was just one of those uh, things where I ordered it and got it and then life happened. So what we have in here are some old Packard Bell computers. In particular, they are Turbo XT clones from the late 1980s. Yeah, if you've seen my videos on the Epson Apex and the Vindex Head Start computers like that, it should be pretty similar to that, but of course it is still sort of its own thing, uh, being from the time when Packard Bell was just licensing designs from other companies. I believe these are probably gonna be manufactured by Samsung, because uh, so many of them were back then. Either way, they do come from Korea, or you know, that's where the design originated, and uh, Packard Bell was just one of the companies licensing those designs. So uh, I'm curious to see what exactly is in here. I mean, I haven't even opened this up. There could be anything in here. It could be full of like flip-flops and termites. I, I, it's all magical unknowns at the moment, but well, let's open it up. And yeah, really, that's all I'm gonna be doing in this video. Opening this up, testing these out, maybe if they're in any condition to be tested, uh, just see what's in there. See if they survived shipping first. All right, so first up here. Ooh, it's a Packard Bell PB500. I believe those were made in 1988. And here we go. The other one is a Packard Bell, uh, what is this, a VX88. I think these were manufactured in 87. And uh, between 87 and 89 for each of these. Okay, well. Uh, that's awesome. I seem to remember both of them being really yellowed, but this one on the top is not. In terms of the front fascia here, these are a bit yellowed. I really like the way those disc drives look. That's pretty cool. Look at the narrow little LEDs. And then this is more familiar here. It's got the one that doesn't actually go down unless there's a disc inside. So this is obviously much more yellowed. Not surprising, because it looks pretty much exactly like a Samsung SPC 3000V or the machines that are you know, pretty close to that. Uh, yeah, this one's not far off either. It does have a reset button down here, which is interesting, but this definitely looks like an older design. I don't know exactly what Samsung model this may have been based on, or even if it was Samsung. Some of them were made by Hyundai, some by Daewoo, whatever. Different companies in Korea made different clones, and yeah, this one in particular looks really familiar. This one, less so. I like that there is a hard drive though, because they didn't come with a hard drive originally. I don't, I don't think. Perhaps it was offered as an option. Ooh, look at all these ports. Phenomenal power switch. Ooh, that feels good. <laughs> this one is almost IBM AT-like in terms of the construction and design, build quality and everything. Like it just, I don't know, immediately feels more substantial. But yeah, uh, it does say made in Korea on each of them, so that's, you know, it never actually says who makes it. Sometimes you can see a company inside. Uh, this one does have a little pass-through for you can plug in a monitor right there. This one does not, interesting. Also doesn't seem to be any expansion cards in here, or at least none with ports. This might be a controller or something, I don't know, we'll see. So we got five pin DIN for keyboard there. I like that there's a space between key and board in the word keyboard. Uh, this one has the connector around front parallel serial video with a color and mono switch. Often saw those on the various clones. So yeah, this should probably allow switching between CGA and NDA over a TTL display, nine pin. And down here we got uh, dip switches, serial and parallel. Uh, no video built in, but we do have a video card. A similar thing, this one has dip switches instead of like this cool little dedicated thing, but well, that is still connected at least. Yeah, I'm gonna say that is an add-on from later on because it's a different uh, texture, slightly different yellowing, so made it a different time perhaps, a different way, who knows. All right, let's open these up. Again, like an IBM AT, there's five screws here. The other one has the screws on the side of the case. <laughs> it would be super cool if this was a 286. I don't think it is. I believe these are both 8088 turbos. 
even though neither one of them have a turbo button physically, uh, often is a software switch or a key combination. So let's see a Phoenix BIOS there. It's looking clean inside, so that's nice. But yeah, nothing installed in the expansion slots. So the power supply is made by Seoshin Musan Company Limited. It's a PS135. I am not familiar with them. Is that the CPU? That's an NEC V40. That's interesting. I have never used one of those. <laughs> All right. Uh, RAM populated here. I don't see anything for the uh, 8087. So it's not installed, that makes sense, but nobody upgraded it either. Oh, I see a blown capacitor right there. Well, that's a thing. In fact, there's a number of these that could very well <laughs> go if it were to be plugged in, but that one's already gone, makes sense. In fact, there is what's remaining of the capacitor. The part that blew off is still in here. Those darn tantalums. I don't think either one of these would have a battery on there, so at least that would not have leaked. All right, oh, hey, whoa. Here's another, another piece. Is that from the same tantalum or is that like, yeah, it kind of looks like it fits. Either way, wow, dude. That went off in spectacular fashion. Someone had some fun before me. <laughs> some fireworks for free. And the PB500 here, so. Screws on the side. There one in the back too. Yeah, one in the back. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So this one has an actual motherboard. Some of these others I've seen, <laughs> very similar looking clones have a, more of a back plane and then like a processor card and some other, yeah, there, there's just different ways that these were made and put together. I haven't seen this one exactly before. So we have a Fujitsu CPU in there, 8088-1. Yeah, huh. there's the keyboard connector for the front of the case there. And there is a controller card for just the hard drive. I guess the floppy plugs in somewhere else. So there's no actual cone PC speaker. We have one of these little piezo beepers here, but that one actually looks a little more substantial. It might sound okay. And we do have some expansion cards. So first up is this video adapter. Oh wow, it's an ATI. This is a GSSC version three Rev3 from 1988. A little bodge right there. It does say made in Korea, even though ATI was Canadian. <laughs> so I don't know if this is like a special thing just for this series of clones or who knows what. There were so many variants of Similar things, they just stuck whatever chips on there that they needed to. I don't know if there's a light pin connection or not. Some of these have a light pin connector there. And then here we have, yeah, I don't know exactly what the card is, but it's Western Digital Controller Card. Dime a dozen, there were all kinds of these. Doesn't look like anything too crazy, but some cobwebs and dust in here, but honestly not too bad. Uh, and I'm not seeing any blown Tantalums, at least on this part that's exposed. Of course, that doesn't mean that they won't blow up <laughs> as soon as it gets power. Uh, could very well. This is fascinating. I've, I've just never seen this. Like, there is still a blanking plate in here for this slot, but then this just goes on top of it to provide the, uh, the top part to screw in because there's no actual plate on the back of the card. I've never seen that combination before. I mean, I quite like it. <laughs> Could I just 3D print this part? Because I've got a number of like uh, modern cards, you know, CF, IDE type of things that don't have a back plate on it either. And so uh, often you get this whole back part and you just make it yourself or whatever. But this, you just put that on top of your existing blanking plate, it's already there. Aha. So over here, you can actually see where the floppy plugs in. So we do have a floppy controller on the motherboard, which again matches up with uh, some of these other clones that I've seen that are very similar to this. I'm just really curious what this hard drive is. <laughs> yeah, it has 100% added later. The screws don't match or anything. So you can see just right there, that is a Seagate ST238R. Got a number of those, and I don't think any of them work. <laughs> Maybe just one of them. It is an RLL hard disk 
half height, five and a quarter inch. I've never had one with the beige bezel like that. I believe those are like 32, 31, 33 megabyte capacity, depending on how you measure it and what the manufacturer wants to say and the formatting and all that. So I thought there weren't any batteries in here at all, but uh, nope, I was wrong. The VX88 does not have one, but the PB500 absolutely does. It's got a Varta barrel battery on the motherboard soldered in there, and it looks clean from this side, but from the other side, I can see a bit of corrosion coming out there, so hopefully it hasn't done too much damage. Honestly, it, it looks okay considering some of the nastiness I've seen over the years. Also, I just found this kind of amusing. The power supply actually connects to the motherboard with only 10 pins. Normally there's 12, but they're, yeah, it's just 10 on this, and they're all together instead of two pieces. You normally have like P8, P9, but yeah, there's only 10 pins even on the connector on the motherboard, so that's different. All right, well, I'm going to say that we probably could test this. I mean, we risk tantalum damage or whatever things. Um, but at the same time, the other one is a definite nope, not for now, because the Tic Tacs have already exploded. So uh, <laughs> I might test the power supply first though. Uh, okay, well, let me go inspect this and I'll, I'll come back and let you know what we're gonna do. All right, so I got everything unplugged from the components, the motherboard and everything, and the computer itself was just testing the power supply. But you know how I mentioned that the pins, it was missing a couple on the AT power connector there? Well, let me get it turned on here, or just the power supply. I just wanted to make sure everything was normal. Like, did they just cut off a couple of pins on the end? And yeah, seems so. You so you have your plus and minus 12 volts. The minus 12 is not as close as you'd maybe like, but whatever. Uh, you've got four green ground in the middle, and then your uh, three plus five on the other end here. So pins one, two, and three are plus five, and then you have just one negative five volt rail. Uh, so that's all that is. Wasn't until later that I realized that the pinout is also printed on the power supply, but <laughs> uh, so I could have verified that just looking at that. But anyway, nice to have um, some uh, multimeter verification. And just as a reference, uh, here's your, your normal unmodified AT power supply. That's just missing the pins one and two there. Yeah, so it was a plus and minus five volt that are just not there. And so you have just the one minus five over there and that's, that's pretty much it. So it's just a couple of missing pins. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Otherwise, I guess. Oh, okay, and there's also two potentiometers in there for adjusting the plus 5 and 12 volt rails. How handy. All right, so I've got an IBM 5154 here connected to the video adapter. I don't know what mode it's set to, but hopefully it's not like set to monochrome MDA or something. CGA or EGA should be good on here. So, let's do it. See if anything pops. Ooh, well that's a pattern. I'm assuming then that maybe something is not correct on the video. Well, I did at least hear the uh, hard drive powering up and made a nice little sound there. There was no beep, but there is typically kind of a long memory check process. So you might not hear that for a while. Ah, uh, let me see about those dip switches. So yeah, the video adapter, the GSS-3, there's the ATI Graphics Solution something or other, Revision 3. And I did verify that that is a uh, CRT light pin connection there. I didn't find the pin out for this exact one, but this looks pretty darn close. I guess it's also known as the uh, Small Wonder, or it's a, there's a whole range of Small Wonder cards like this. But anyway, that's what this one appears to be. So it does do CGA and monochrome, and there's some switches there to change between them. Apparently it also does support the Plantronics Color Plus mode in addition to CGA and monochrome, which is pretty neat. Let me mess with the dip switches, see what we get. Wow. Okay, so now we're getting no display. <laughs> So I guess those were the wrong settings. And there was that extra beeping there. So let's see what else we can try.
All right, well, I couldn't get this going exactly. I don't know if it's the dip switches. I mean, I tried all the different settings. I just switched around the switches for a bit there while it was powered on. And it either gave me no signal or just that pattern or like those angry beeps with no pattern anyway. So I've got uh, one of my old standbys here, uh, EGA card that I know works. Just pulled this from my IBM AT. So we'll try this real quick. Hmm, yeah, well, we get a display. That's, uh, that's good. It got that same angry beeping though. So I'm assuming that means that that was just gonna beep anyway. <laughs> And this needs some other dip switch setting, or who knows, maybe it's RAM, I don't know. Speaking of RAM, let's just let the machine do its test here, which I believe is, this is like my uh, Vindex head start. It'll probably go through twice, so there we go. Oh, got floppy and hard disk activity, oh, dude! Lazy Susan 4.12, what is this? Password, oh man, is it farts? Nope, Ability Plus. Well, I was not expecting this. Hey, we've got a working hard drive and a working system, at least for now. Whoa, what in the heck? What is all this? Is this the, like just contents of the hard drive? These are documents. Oh man, personal information, hello. Dude, dated 1996. Hmm, please point at a file. Hey. Wow, dude. Okay, I'm going to see if I can get this backed up real quick, uh, assuming that this drive works so I can get another connection going, uh, and I will be back. <laughs> no pun intended, I will be back up. All right, move the machine down here to connect it up to the Megalumina Monster over parallel cable with lap link going and... <laughs> it's making soothing little noises. Oh, I hope that hard disk holds up long enough to get all this backed up because I want to see what these programs are. I can't find any information really on that lazy Susan thing that seems to be password protecting the system. It's just, I don't know, there's fascinating stuff in here. So anyway, hopefully I can get that backed up. I've also noticed that the um, the power LED also says speed. And from what I can gather, you're supposed to be able to uh, perform a keyboard switch to put that into the faster speed mode. I think it boots up slow speed uh, and it's amber and then green when it's faster. But uh, I noticed that when it boots from the hard disk, it does actually go into the faster speed, so I believe maybe it's a TSR that needs to load to control that, I don't know. Anyway, that's one of those things I'm hoping to get off of this hard drive and then maybe get around that password protection thing. Eh, we'll see how this goes. And since we got all this lovely hard disk activity going, why not enjoy a moment of zen as the old Seagate does its thing? No more angry beeping. And yeah, everything seems to be working great. All the files copied over, the hard drive is still working, or at least it was before I just booted it. Um, yeah, eh, it'll, it'll get there. Anyway, yeah, eh. So anyway, I've got all the files um, that weren't personal information. Backed up, uploaded to archive.org, so check the video description if you're curious to see what was on there. Maybe you can crack the password to that uh, Lazy Susan program. Um, but yeah, I've gone ahead and bypassed that. Just edited the autoexec.bat to uh, not boot that up. And it was that simple. It no longer is password protected. And now we have full access to the contents of the hard drive and the machine. We can actually execute our own programs. It is running MS-DOS version 3.30, by the way, in case anyone was wondering. And in terms of the hard disk and memory situation, yeah, 640K, almost 
33 megs of space with around 23 megs available on disk. Yeah, I put like another five and a half megabytes of game files on here. Ooh, man, so extravagant. Let me see that CPU speed thing. It's actually uh, executable right here. From Packard Bell, November 1st, 1988. Yeah, it sets it between uh, either of the two speeds a CPU can do. So 4.77 or 9.54 megahertz. I have it just set to start up in the fast speed. And we also have the keyboard combo. So control alt minus goes slow and plus goes fast. Yay. Now, unfortunately the power slash speed LED here doesn't actually switch from amber to green as I think it's supposed to, uh, depending on the speed mode you're in, it just, it just stays amber all the time. So maybe something's not hooked up. Maybe the program doesn't do it. Maybe, I don't know, maybe something's just funky in the Previous owner, they obviously reconfigured some things when they upgraded to the hard drive because this used to be fully floppy disk based. But anyway, we also have, uh, this is interesting, we got Borland Sidekick, a version of that from 1985. NES is a pretty popular TSR at the time, just lets you do all kinds of uh, random things straight from DOS. So you can do your regular DOS things and then just pop this up and get a notepad, a calculator, a calendar, and there's a bug flying around. It can't get rid of that. I wish it could. But yeah, all kinds of things you can do. Dialer, ASCII table, setup. Yeah, handy stuff in the days before GUIs became really popular and DOS was DOS. <laughs> We've also got this utility folder filled with utilities, perhaps from a DOS supplemental disc or something that Packard Bell came with. I don't know. It's, it's got things in there that aren't terribly exciting. Uh, what else we got on here? Oh yeah, there's also uh, this teach directory. I was curious if this would be another um, ATI thing, and I saw the ATI file, and yes it is. American Training International. They made these trainer programs and uh, yeah, licensed them out to various OEMs and manufacturers. Packard Bell apparently had their own. And yeah, this is just one of those things that lets you know how to use your PC. And uh, mostly just basic stuff that applies to most any PC, but yeah, usually is customized just a little for each company. You know, the Vendex Head Start had it. I think some of the Epsons had it. It's simple, but effective in teaching you how to use your brand new whatever the heck you've got. <laughs> yeah, I was also intrigued. What, what was this crystal directory here? I thought, oh, it can't be a crystal sound chip. No, but then I saw CC1, oh, of course. It's Crystal Caves a Apogee classic shareware platformer. Probably the very first game I ever played, honestly. And uh, yeah, I was happy to see this made its way up to Canada. I mean, of course, why not? It was a popular game back then. And uh, here's a copy from the previous owner. Neat. I do wonder if they ever actually got a chance to play it though, because it's an EGA game. Oh man. And yeah, it does not run well <laughs> on a system of this speed and configuration and such. Yeah, we got 640k RAM, but you need more than that, man. And yeah, this is in the uh, high speed mode, so the full almost 10 megahertz. Eh, yeah. I mean, I had a CGA card in here before, so I just wonder if they ever got it off the ground. And you also probably noticed there that the PC speaker is unfortunately very quiet when those little piezoelectric things we saw earlier. I was hoping it'd be a little louder than it is. They are often quiet and this one is very quiet. So that sucks. But hey, we do have the opportunity to play some other things that'll run a little bit better like the CGA version of Commander Keen episode four. And yeah, we got an EGA card in here, but from what I remember the CGA one runs a little better. Plus I had this copied over cause I was hoping to get that ATI GSSC card that it came with working and that's CGA, but I still haven't gotten that going. But anyway, oh yeah, uh, definitely significantly better than Crystal Caves in EGA. Oh, it's just a shame that that little speaker is so quiet. I do wonder if a full size like cone speaker can be connected, if there is a, a header for it on the motherboard perhaps. That would be a great upgrade, at least in my opinion. I know some folks like quiet speakers, but I'm not one of them. All right, so let's go ahead and run Top Bench here just to see what kind of performance we're getting relative to the list of things in the database. I don't know, it's just one of those things I always like running as a benchmark. So more often than not, these run at an eight, 
Looks like we've got a score of seven. All right. Yeah, seven or eight, whatever. It comes close to this XT clone, Turbo XT submitted by someone. That had a score of eight. So if we switch, that brings us down to a four. So that is right into uh, the 4.77 megahertz range that you'd see on a typical XT. Yeah, neat. <laughs> no surprises there. It's just like, yes, you have a Turbo XT. What did you think you'd get? And lastly, I don't know, let's uh, load up a little Sylphide here because this is one of those games that looks and plays impressively. It's just enjoyable and also uh, has pretty good performance, all things considered, for a system of this speed is actually pretty awesome. CGA at around eight to 10 megahertz. <laughs> the poor PC speaker. Oh man, this is not going well. There we go. Yeah, this is one of those where you can't play the, uh, you know, music and sound effects at the same time, which, you know, PC speaker, whatever, limitations, but it doesn't really do anything clever to try to get around that either. Anyway. Yeah, nice performance. This is good stuff. An ad lib card would certainly be a nice little upgrade for this system. Kind of goes without saying, it's always, you know, that's always the course of action that it comes to these. It's like, ooh, maybe I can make it go a little faster. Maybe I can give it nominally better sound. And then, yeah, whatever. It's Turbo XT. These things are fun. They're all very, very similar, but they all have their unique quirks, and that's why. I find these so interesting. Man, I'm just glad that this one works. All right, well, that is about it. I do want to get the other one going because I find that more uh, appealing in terms of the external design and some of the internal components. I don't know, I just haven't used an older generation or you know, that particular series of Turbo XTs from Packard Bell before, whereas this one is really quite close to the other ones that I have. I do want to see if uh, maybe I can get this working. I ran across this on minus zero degrees. There was a manual for some of the graphics solution cards. I don't know if it, this is for the exact revision that was in here, but there's some dip switch things to try. So I'm gonna try that real quick. Hey, there we go. Wow, those dip switches worked. So I guess uh, when I was farting around with it earlier, I somehow didn't get the exact right combo between the four. All right. Well, hey, since we have the card going, I mean, it's a CGA card. We've seen some CGA stuff already, but it's also support, uh, bleh, supposed to support Plantronics Color Plus mode. So we can try Planet X3, <laughs> Plantronics X3 as just one of the few games that does support it. And, hey, there we go, yeah, that's awesome. So we got the additional colors here. That's really cool. Yeah, I'll do a different map, why not? Yeah, I love when these particular clone cards, whenever they have that kind of chipset, you can pretty much guess that it's going to have this color plus support. So 16 colors. That's just really cool. It's a fascinating graphics mode and I wish uh, more games supported it. <laughs> but you know, this one does. So it's always a, a neat thing to show off and try and whatnot. I mean, I, I pretty much knew that this card would have it since the manual that I just found said that it did. And so did uh, some of the websites, but sometimes you'll get these cards and they just look like they might support it. And you don't know until you actually test it out. But yeah, in this case, uh, it's exactly what it said it would be. So, fantastic. And I guess really at this point, the main thing that I gotta do is get that CMOS battery out there, maybe replaced, and then just clean it up. Maybe do some retro brighting. I mean, I think that would benefit this particular system rather well. Nah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Let me know what you think. Perhaps you'd like to see that. I hope that you enjoyed seeing the, the experimentation, the testing, you know, just checking out a computer that I wasn't sure what kind of condition it would be in, you know, it hadn't been tested, so you never know. Do check out some of my other videos if you like seeing old things like this coming back to life. And as always, thank you for watching.